Bonjour à tous. Join us. Pour ton invitation. I mean, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm always honored. I'm even moved to be invited to medical conferences. I was trained as a, a doctor, as a physician, but I have uh, moved away from uh, this job, although I, I am loyal to the medical profession. But today I came to tell you about something else, something very different from uh, daily, your daily work as physicians. I was asked to choose the subject freely. And because I have recently published two books about mountains and I live part of the year in the mountains, I thought maybe I could uh, use the metaphor of uh, mountaineering or mountains uh, as an addiction because that's the subject you're working on, addictions. There are many ways, obviously, to enjoy the mountains. You can go skiing for a week and that might not be an addiction. But I would like to tell you about mountain climbing and uh, spending time in the, the uh, in in the mountains because that is possibly something closer to what you are discussing during these three days. If uh, there is something that is useless, that you're prepared to do anything to get it, and you're depressed if you don't get it, if if I tell you that something uh, is dangerous and possibly could uh, kill you, that something will give you both pain and pleasure, or if I tell you that uh, this is something that when you consume it, you need to increase the doses, uh, you will be uh, tempted to say, well, what you're talking about is a drug. It's an addiction. It's a substance. Well, Mountaineering meets all of these uh, features. Uh, it's useless. You, you're all familiar with the uh, Lionel Therese uh, book, uh, The Useless Conquerors, uh, a beautiful book. The book is far from being useless because it helps you understand what it's all about. But uh, the fact that uh, you risk your life on a daily basis, that is true. And it actually kind of summarizes uh, all the books that have been published about mountaineering, which is a bit sad. And the fact that once you taste it, you have to increase the dosage, that is also something that you are familiar with. Because when you start climbing or doing sports in the mountains, you always want to do better and uh, to reach your limits and sometimes uh, go over your limits and and going over your limits sometimes means that you end up dead there was um, an alpinist called Uyo Steck he was from Switzerland and one of my friends actually shot a film on him he climbed the south face of the Annapurna and uh, not Maurice Herzog's uh, pathway up the Annapurna, but the difficult side. And this movie that was shot about his life, or his story, the title of the movie was The uh, Total Accomplishment Syndrome, meaning that in this kind of uh, activity, moving is something essential. And when you reach your maximum limit, usually uh, things go wrong. You, you collapse and you distack. After he had climbed that mountain, died, although he always uh, managed to come out unscathed of many difficult situations, he died after climbing the Annapurna. Because I believe, that's my assumption, I believe that he had actually reached his own limit and there was nothing else after that except death. Pain and pleasure, that is also one of the main features of mountaineering. Now, everybody knows that uh, the sea can also be attractive, and, and lots of books have been published about the sea, but mountaineering and mountains in general are not quite so famous and have not uh, elicited uh, many books. I'd like to tell you about something which is not so far away from the main, the, the harshest uh, addictions to the hardest uh, substances. There was a book by uh, an American called McCoy called uh, The Policy of Heroin. He was, uh, it was written in the 90s. And he actually disclosed Many new ideas. At the time, it was new. Now it would be uh, common knowledge, but at the time, it was new. And the idea was that 
de ces drogues comme l'héroïne, comme la drugs uh, such as heroin or cocaine um, bon, tout, tout les... started being disseminated internationally and cannabis as well. And ayahuasca as well, but, you know, they started being disseminated uh, globally only when a traditional use of those drugs came across a, an external factor. As far as heroin is concerned, it was the war in Vietnam, but it could be something else. And the same happens with mountains. The highest mountains, you know, when you go to Chamonix, you can get a glimpse of the Mont Blanc. When you're in the Himalaya, you can get a glimpse of the Everest. And this is where I would like to make a comparison with substances. Those mountains uh, were considered as uh, godly dwellings where only the gods could live. And people believed they had powers magical powers, almost supernatural powers, and uh, exemplified by uh, storms and lightning. But people thought that only the gods could live on the mountains. And some people still believe that Mount Kelai is a sacred mountain, and uh, no one is allowed to climb on that mountain because it's considered by the local population by as a... Um, a sacred mountain where only gods will live, and you're not supposed to disturb the gods by climbing on the mountain. So that's where we started from. And in France, for many years, where I live, there is a mountain called Mount Jolie, and Jolie comes from, Mount Jovi, and Jovi comes from Jupiter. Jove in Italian or Latin, uh, it was considered as a Jupiter's dwelling. Obviously, nowadays, it makes us smile, but it does provide an explanation with regard to the fact that for many years, only people who themselves uh, were somewhere in between man and God who uh, allowed themselves to climb those mountains. Only they dared go up the mountains. Contact with metals and fire in many civilizations is considered as magical. And the people who practice the arts of fire are usually kept aside. In Ethiopia, the Falashas, the Falashas were the the uh, local Jews, and very often they worked with fire, with metal, and they were kept outside of the community because it was believed that uh, they had something to do with the subterranean uh, dwellings of the gods, and those gods living under the surface of the earth were considered as uh, bad. So for centuries, who dared go up the mountains, uh, the highest peaks? Hunters and people who looked for crystal, people who went up digging for mining for crystals. And that's interesting because a crystal is like a miracle, it's a geological miracle in places that do not seem to have any specific features. There are things that look like ovens, natural ovens inside the earth, inside the ground, in which things develop that are considered like a miracle, crystals. And crystals are very uh, beautiful and valuable. And the people mining for crystal were the only ones who dared take a risk of climbing mountains. Hunters all the way to the place where animals and beasts uh, went. Uh, not very high up, not in glaciers. Interesting about Mont Blanc, the uh, glaciers on the Mont Blanc remained unviolated until the 18th century. This is very late. Why is it that this uh, practice that used to be a very local practice, uh, almost a, a magical one, with the secret uh, uh, characters. Why is it that all of, a sudden, all of a sudden it became a global practice? Well, it's due to tourism. Uh, the Brits, who invented many things, who went to uh, walk in those regions, and they invented tourism, tourism being 
uh, something that they found extremely diffi difficult to define, a kind of a attraction for the world at large. And this is one of the main features of the 18th century, and uh, nothing, revolu nothing revolutionary in this philosophy, but it opened up rationality to the world. And this is uh, the feature of the 18th century philosophers. They were not uh, content with uh, doing philosophy in their own room. They want to go out in the wild world and see the savages in America, uh, uh, try and look at them, how do they live, the culture of the world. There were an immense curiosity that developed for philosophical reasons back in the 18th century. And this appeal, the attraction for the mountain, was kind of a byproduct of this uh, attitude. William and Peacock were the first uh, two uh, English uh, men, we went all the way up to the um, ice sea, the Montambert, the Montambert uh, train. If you feel like going there next summer, you'll find a rock on the way, on the path, from Limotet uh, to the Montanvert, a rock on which there is an engraving. They carved the name, or these two names, the twin names of Peacock and Wyndham, in the mid-18th uh, century. In the context of this local uh, uh, world environment organized or self-organized, very few, very little contacts with the outside world. With the uh, uh, international curiosity, uh, tourism, uh, uh, created Alpin, um, tourism and uh, mountaineering. A majority of these people were uh, uh, coming from England and Wimper, who uh, Wimper uh, was a, a, a drawer. Uh, he was uh, sent out by his father to produce engravings of the Alps. He became fascinated, uh, passionate uh, for the Alpine summits and decided to climb them. So the problem was that they could not go there. They didn't know enough about how to climb mountains. So you found someone locally to go with them. And that was the beginning of the guide, the guide de haute montagne. The guides were peasants, uh, crystal finders, uh, uh, people who were used to climbing mountains, even though they didn't know it very well. And the English people uh, brought something to them, a global curiosity that uh, uh, they were not used to. So alpinism, uh, mountaineering, was created by the conjunction of these two uh, traditions, a local uh, kind of mystical tradition as a, and, and international tradition, uh, which was uh, uh, created in the 18th century. They couldn't accept the idea that there were places in the world uh, that uh, were not possible to um, access that became unfamiliar so much for the rationality of this world. They were opposed to accepting that some places or, uh, in the world or historical circumstances uh, might escape uh, reason. In another field, which is uh, humanitarian assistance, the same trend, you know, uh, at the time of uh, uh, large uh, earthquakes, the Lisbon um, earthquake, it was a kind of a, of a shock. It's uh, Lisbon. Uh, cathedral. It was on a Sunday. Uh, cathedral collapsed, uh, and the uh, uh, faithful, and it was a kind of revolt. The church who claimed that no, this is sent by providence, you must accept this, as opposed to uh, rationalist philosophy and Voltaire being the leader of this clan, said no, not at all. Especially in these extreme areas, in the extreme uh, uh, trials, uh, like a big earthquake. You have uh, to face it. You must uh, be show solidarity. You must fight. You must try uh, to understand. And this is the beginning of the uh, humanitarian movement. And uh, in Voltaire, Candide travels in uh, the street. He says, this is the best world. What about the other worlds? Kind of a revolt against the idea that a so-called provenance would be uh, all-powerful uh, and would withdraw from the realm of reason, certain events. Same thing for mountains and mountaineering. 
you're not supposed, we want to go there and see. You say there are gods up there, we want to go up to the top of the mountain to see the gods or not to find them. Now, uh, it said that these mountains touch the skies, they want to go up there and show you that there's nothing there, nothing else than ice, snow, things that can be handled, can be uh, understood and therefore dominated. So that was the beginning of this adventure of uh, mountaineering. So this summit is something that did not exist. It was every vases and not, uh, crystal. Those who were uh, hunting for crystal didn't care about uh, climbing to the summit. It was just uh, they were uh, l'aiguille du midi because it was a southern facing at all summit summit. Reaching the summit became a symbolical, uh, uh, symbolical feature. Getting near or closer to the summit was showing that uh, there again there is nothing, nothing else than nature and what you can actually grasp. Horace Benedict de Saussure, a uh, Swiss, uh, organized a competition at the end of that century to uh, to uh, uh, congratulate the one who would reach the summit of the Mont Blanc, uh, which uh, seemed to be unattainable. Belma was a, a, a crystal a hunter and uh, looking for crystal, and Dr. Pacard, who was a surgeon. It's not by chance that in this pair of individuals, you find these two components, they climbed, although they won the prize, the Saussure Prize, and a few years later, they uh, 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 took Saussure with them up to the uh, uh, moment. Of course, Saussure was not a good mountaineering. He had to be carried at some point. Anyway, he went up there with the measurement instruments as if is reaching that point with a kind of reason reaching the tip the, the tip of the mountain, which so far had can, can, can been considered as the exclusive preserve of the gods. He went up there with a, a thermometer, a barometer to take measurements and to take reason uh, up there. This empirism of the 19th century up to that extreme uh, tip. So that's how it all started. Very interesting to see that this uh, uh, concept of a summit the tip of the mountain became all prevailing. The first mountaineers who came up with this concept of a summit. Uh, uh, what is a summit? What is it? It's nothing in the uh, uh, one square meter in general. When you reach up there, you are already cold. You stay there for five minutes. Uh, you eat a slice of saucisson, and then you climb down. But all of a sudden, became a symbolical. A mountain can only be known if you reach the tip of the mountain, the top of it. That was a new th way of thinking. So uh, summits, some summits were given names, those that were actually uh, reached and those that were not reached yet. And that was the beginning of a kind of competition uh, with the uh, uh, rising of nation states in Europe. This uh, determination to set the borders of one's territory uh, with borders or fight even to, uh, for your frontiers, it was transposed to mountains and summits uh, became national uh, symbols of what you could do. For instance, the tip of the mountain horn, uh, you've seen it, it's, can, it's a very special uh, uh, shape, kind of a strange uh, uh, tip or top. So Wimper wanted to climb up there as a, a Brit, a, an English mountaineer. But back in the 1860s, Italy had just become united. You may have the Solferino, etc. Uh, was the beginning of um, Italian unity. The s Italian state uh, was born there. And a local guide um, was uh, asked by Wimper uh, to uh, help him reach the uh, summit. At this this guide, and there was the beginning of this kind of a, a human tragedy, it's very touching. The guide uh, was torn between the desire to earn money, so he didn't say no to what Wimper suggested, but he wanted to give to this summit, uh, give it to Italy. He was Italian. Uh, Italy has just been created, so he wanted to go with him. 
but he was not really keen on helping me to the summit. And if you uh, uh, climb the uh, Matterhorn by the Lion Ridge, at some place, the ridge uh, called the Pintindal, uh, and just at the point where it goes, it meets the main part of the Matterhorn. Uh, that is kind of a trunk. Uh, Karel went and uh, 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 said, no, we can't go there. It's a big hole. We can't cross it, so we have to go down. So the uh, companion went down, but he, he realized that he couldn't make it by uh, stepping down to his state. So he came back again the next day. He didn't manage either. And the story goes that he didn't wake on time, so Wimper crossed to the uh, a, um, a, the other side and was able to climb to the top of the Matanan. So he was in, unfortunate because climbing down the Matanan, Wimper, uh, uh, that was a, a disaster, the first uh, uh, disaster in the mountains because uh, uh, there were uh, four uh, uh, English on the rope uh, and uh, they had met other English people before leaving the hotel and they too wanted to climb the Matan. And they were well behaved and, uh, and courteous. They said, okay, why don't you come with us? But the other three who didn't have the same uh, experience climbing down, uh, one fell. Each one, uh, uh, there, there was a rope, but there was a thinner rope between uh, the uh, rope of uh, five and the rope of three, and the rope uh, broke up, and three fell to their death. And this is why this uh, conquest, which was a missed opportunity to uh, win uh, the adventure, uh, and was, uh, there was a tinge of uh, drama, tragedy, and this is why the mountain from that day onwards became synonymous with death or mortal uh, risk. Because in uh, a half a second, three of these mountaineers disappeared. So, this uh, nationalistic history, uh, I mean, when I started mountaineering, uh, the uh, motto of the Alpine Club was uh, for uh, the homeland and uh, for the mountain. There were competition between Italian uh, mountaineers and French ones. On the Grand de Jorasse, uh, where um, uh, Winter, Wimper, when they climbed uh, first, the Grand Jorasse, and then the uh, Aiguille Verte that will actually climb three days later. And the Italians uh, uh, climbed uh, the uh, Walker Spur a few days, a few years earlier. See, this is strange because uh, until the, um, the 1970s, the mountain, mountains has always been uh, a, a national symbol. Nothing to do with philosophy. You know, there's nothing there except snow, no God to be found anywhere. So that's uh, the, for the philosophical demonstration. All you could do was uh, climb, and uh, that was a conquest. And there's a very interesting scene, which is uh, still present in, the, uh, in our memories, uh, the north face of the Eiger, which was a big problem, a big issue back in the 30s, uh, where uh, mountaineers who were uh, uh, members of the uh, National Socialist Party uh, decided that it would offer uh, the North Face of the Eiger to Hitler. At the same time, two Austrians, who were, of course, anti-fascists, tried the same thing, the same uh, climb. Of course, uh, they haven't met. And there was a storm. And the four of them uh, went together, two Nazis and two anti-Nazis. So this is some, the, the, the miracle uh, that uh, mountains is capable to create. The four of them climbed to the uh, top, and of course, uh, it was a, a big success. Following the Second World War, this uh, race for the conquest of uh, peaks uh, took a new turn in the Himalaya because after the Second World War, Europe was uh, drained and exhausted. Uh, everybody had lost their morale. People had become pessimistic. And um, the various countries started racing uh, to conquer the Himalayan uh, summits. 
not only to uh, bring a victory to their country, but also to uh, actually find the youth of the time something to root for. And every European country conquered one of the Himalayan peaks. The Everest was conquered by the English in 1953. The Italians uh, got the K2, and the French got uh, the Annapurna. And every time, there were very strange stories to be told, sometimes even shady stories, because when the Italians conquered K2, that actually led to a court case. There was so much at stake. It was a power struggle, really. And, uh, you know, anything could be done. And when Walter Bonatti climbed K2, donc a fait la dernière and, um, partie du dernier camp pour gravir le sommet. Climbed from the last uh, camp to the uh, summit. One of his colleagues did not like it, and he went down by night with his uh, companion, with whom he had gone up to the summit, and they started calling out during the night because they wanted to find the tents, they wanted to find the camp because they were lost in the night and those sleeping in the tents did not reply. They left it at 8,500 meters, they allowed them to get lost, although they heard them shouting and uh, they were prepared to allow them to die in the mountains because that would have been a way to defeat them. Them. I mean, that shows how addicted the uh, people were already at the time. It was uh, a power struggle, really. And for France, uh, the Annapurna, there was also a big discussion to determine whether Maurice Herzog actually got to the very top of the Annapurna. His daughter published some years ago... Uh, Something that has been uh, suspected for years uh, in the uh, last attempt to climb the Annapurna, Herzog and Lachnal found themselves uh, together attempting to climb the Annapurna. And they were almost dying. They were freezing to death. They were not properly equipped. And Lachnal, who was a great guide at the time, he was a professional guide. He did nothing else. And he, uh, he had to keep his hands and feet because he could do nothing else uh, for a living. He said, we need to go back because we're going to freeze to death. And Herzog was not a professional alpinist or mountaineer. A mountaineer. He had studied uh, trade and he was very ambitious. And he knew almost by chance that he had been appointed chief of this uh, expedition. And he said, this is not going to happen twice. I will not get the same opportunity again. So he insisted on continuing. And Lachenal, the guide, allegedly turned to him and said, look, for my entire life, I will tell people that we climbed to the top, but let's go back. And I will not renege. I will tell people that we made it to the top. And so there is this uh, picture where we see Erdog uh, lifting his uh, tool. And uh, it seems like he's not quite at standing at the top and there were still a few yards to uh, walk. And uh, they went back and their fingers and uh, toes were frozen and they had to be amputated and Lachnal could not work anymore as a guide and Herzog gave him money throughout his life. Uh, people said he was being generous, but other people believed that they uh, actually had made a deal and that the tragedy uh, led people to believe that they had conquered the summit, but they never had. And when I uh, joined uh, this... Um, environment of mountaineering in the 70s, it was the end of that race for summits. All the summits had been climbed and conquered. They had names, they had been conquered and climbed uh, from the north, from the south, from the east, from the west. So that race had stopped. And something else happened, another current that had developed in the US in the wake of the hippie movement 
with uh, those uh, young boys or with those boys who used to climb the Yosemite Park uh, granite mountains. And uh, those guys were smoking cannabis uh, and they uh, lived uh, on those uh, mountains for weeks. They simply lived in a vertical position all the time because they were doing nothing but climbing on those upright walls. And because of them, mountaineering got rid of everything that dragged it down. It became lighter. They created a new set of rules. One was supposed to climb with as little equipment as possible, no artificial methods, in the book that I have recently published on the uh, front page, there is a picture of um, us, myself, and some friends when we climbed the uh, Aiguille de la République with a bow because we wanted to uh, imitate uh, the first time it was climbed uh, above uh, Chamonix. And uh, the, the man at the time brought his bow. He was a hunter, and he uh, shot with his bow above the uh, summit and got the, uh, the rope anchored to the other side of the summit, and he used that to uh, climb. And so, you know, mountaineers at the time used anything, ladders, wood wedges, and starting in the 19, late 60s, 1968, in the States, in the Yosemite community, the, the idea was to do nothing but touch the rock with your own hands and feet, and firmins, they call it at the time, use Fair means, natural means, loyal, something not artificial. And if uh, people used ropes to, uh, well, nobody wanted to die, honestly, but all they did was use ropes to make sure if they felt that they would not uh, fall down all the way. So uh, they had these uh, safety ropes, but nothing else. And somebody uh, came under the limelight in Europe, somebody called Patrick Edlinger, if you remember him. He was a kind of revelation. There was a movie, The uh, Mountain with Your Bare Hands. And Patrick Edlinger was a, a byproduct of the American Yosemite uh, era. So he wore nothing, just a pair of shorts, a T-shirt, a little... Uh, headscarf, and a little bag with magnesia powder, and nothing else. And he led people to believe that you could actually go into this world of mountaineering in a magical way. You turned it into something wonderful, contrary to what was uh, done until then. It had nothing to do with pain or death. It was all about grace and beauty, lightness. And that was what mattered most. And it was also a kind of a social revolution because those people uh, lived in uh, Volkswagen combi vans uh, and uh, would camp uh, for days uh, at the bottom of the mountains eating uh, out of uh, cans eating beans out of the cans. And uh, this happened uh, in the Himalaya. In the 1970s, there was one last uh, French expedition in the Everest with Pierre Mazou, Afanasiev, uh, funded by the French state, by the French government, with uh, guides and, and, and men to carry the luggage. But that was the last time, and it was being replaced progressively by something much more graceful. And uh, Patrick Edinger was a very thin and blonde, ethereal-looking man who looked like an angel, and he was the epitome of uh, this new mountaineering fashion. Mountaineering became a source of pleasure, and climbing mountains became a graceful sort of dance. Actually, some climbers today, like Stéphanie Bonnet, who's written, she was the world champion, 
And she has written beautiful books, and she says it's like vertical yoga. She says, no one cares about the summit. I mean, I have walked the, uh, the road to St. Uh, James of Compostela, and uh, it's not getting there that matters. It's the, 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 the path. And, you know, when you get there, when you get to Compostela, you're disappointed because it's like a big fair and there are shops sending you uh, shells uh, in, under, in all the forms and key rings and everything. And you, you, you say, I haven't walked hundreds of kilometers just for that, which means that it's not the um, getting there that matters, it's how you get there. And it's the same applies to the mountain. All of a sudden, the summit itself lost much of its uh, interest. It was uh, more the uh, the way you got there that mattered. You start from the top and you climb to the you start from the bottom, sorry, and you climb to the top. But it becomes a philosophy of how you get there, and it's been um, even uh, amplified by uh, the fact that uh, now there are climbing uh, rooms in uh, cities, and people who live in cities go to those places and they climb on the wall. They uh, do not climb a mountain, then climb on a wall, a climbing wall. And uh, in Paris, in Fontainebleau, near Paris, there is a forest with uh, many, many rocks. And people go to Fontainebleau to practice climbing mountains uh, in a very graceful movement. And they don't care about getting to the top. What matters is how you do it. So it led to a bit of a misunderstanding. The willingness to uh, remove pain, death, from mountaineering and everything that has to that mountaineering has in common with an addiction, all of a sudden they realized it was impossible. When Patrick Edlinger stopped climbing, he became an alcoholic. Seriously, and he died falling down the stairs, whereas he had climbed unbelievably steep mountains everywhere across France, and all of a sudden he died of an addiction, possibly the fact that he had been addicted to mountaineering uh, and uh, was replaced by alcohol when he stopped climbing. So how can I tell you about this? And that's why I'm very surprised that you asked me to uh, tell you about this. But you, you're here. You have nowhere else to go, so I'll take the advantage and the opportunity to tell you about this. I don't get often the chance to talk about mountaineering in this way. It was a heroic time for both mountaineering and literature about mountain climbing, a time during which we writers got people interested in what was happening. It was a time of conquest, and you know there were dramas uh, where books were being written, like uh, Premier de Cordé, a very famous book by. Uh, and there was this uh, dramatic uh, figure of the, the guide, the guide who sacrifices himself because uh, he is climbing with a client who wants to go on when he himself knows that there is going to be a storm and it's time to go back and yeah actually ends up paying with his life the fact that his client wanted to go on. And uh, so there was uh, there were many books being written, for Orange, Ramus in Switzerland, Rigonista in Italy, all about drama and things taking place in the mountains. People knew how to talk about mountains and mountaineering and how to get people passionate about it because it actually sounded like a fight. There were heroes and the heroes could uh, fight a battle, and there were even people who were not mountain climbers themselves and got hold of this opportunity. Um, I, uh, in the French Academy, I have replaced Henri Troya, and Henri Troya wrote a book called uh, La Neige en Deuil, The Morning Snow. He was not a, he was not a, uh, himself a mountain climber. He had married the widow of a uh, doctor in Samonie, uh, and he lived in Samonie and, Samonie and moved from one bar to the next. But he never actually climbed the mountain. But he wrote a book about uh, a drama taking place in the mountain. And in his book, The Morning Snow, he showed something that was not easy to uh, describe in literature. 
And so in literature, people started talking about nothing but accidents. And not just in the mountains. Progressively, people started talking about uh, crashes, airplane crashes or helicopter crashes, all kinds of crashes and accidents. Because an accident is, is about a time in life. I don't know if you know about Vincent Dan and Henri. Uh, Two young men in 1955 who left to, to climb the Mont Blanc in, right in the middle of winter found themselves uh, in a storm after several days. We don't exactly understand why it took them so long and they got lost. And Walter Bonatti, who was an unbelievable guy, strong, found them in the storm, took them to the uh, La Fourche camp and then took them to the top of the Mont Blanc, and he was going to Italy, he was going home, and he showed them how to go back uh, towards France. But they uh, took the wrong... They took the wrong um, direction, and they ended up on a plateau, and they can be seen from Chamonix, and people could see them from Chamonix dying, freezing to death up there, and they could not find their way down. And one helicopter tried to uh, save them, but at the time, the helicopters were piston helicopters, so they could not go up there because there was not enough oxygen in the air. And the second helicopter was uh, there and was too heavy, so two pilots wearing nothing but T-shirts went up in their helicopters, and those poor guys had been there for two weeks with nothing to eat, no and when the helicopter was about to land, it hit a rock and uh, crashed right next to them. So I'm not going to tell you the whole story, but you see the world of uh, mountaineering accidents became uh, the subject of uh, tragedies. But there comes a time when people grow tired of tragedies because tragedies do not summarize what really is about what it really is about. And so these um, stories became visual. People started shooting, shooting movies. However, it's difficult to tell the stories. Nowadays, it's very difficult to uh, climb mountains. Uh, you hear people say, I've, gone, I've done an eight or I've done a nine. A former minister got caught a few months ago because he showed a picture of himself climbing a wall, a vertical wall, and uh, the uh, newspaper Canard Enchaîné showed that they had cropped the picture and uh, photoshopped it and that the guy was actually lying on his belly and not climbing a vertical mountain at all. So it means nothing nowadays to say I'm a mountain climber and that's not the best way to tell about mountaineering. There are better ways, but they need to be found. And right now, it is a challenge for most of us. So there are some beautiful books. Uh, Paolo Cognati's book, which was published two years ago, and it tells about intermediate height mountains. I have recently published a book. And I, I really believe in this. I want to uh, tell about the mountains as a love story, because you can only tell about your passion for mountains if you talk about a love story, a love passion. It's the same. If you take two people and you try and understand what brings them together or brings, takes them apart, it's the same with mountains. And by telling that love story, you get people to understand that the passion for mountains, which is an addiction, can vary. It's, it's a bit unconscious. It's difficult to explain. It's, it takes you, and it sometimes makes you do crazy things. Finalement, parler de la montagne aujourd'hui, je pense qu'on ne peut le faire. So in order to talk about the mountain. Right now, you need to tell a love story if, if there are such a thing as love stories in the, in the mountains. And I'd like to conclude by um, using the comparison between addiction and mountaineering again. I mean, I uh, 
spun it into a, uh, a ball and because I wanted to talk about this today, but I'm going to unspin what I have just spun because the mountain is an addiction and at the same time something to protect you from addictions. Let me explain. It's very important that in today's world, we make sure there are places where we can actually take responsibility for our own life. And by that, I don't mean you have to risk your life. Rebuffay used to say, look for difficulties, but not for danger. So, facing danger in a controlled way, including lethal dangers, but by mitigating them, because you have developed a technique to control the danger, it's very human, and we need to do it. You can learn to do it. And for those of you who uh, practice extreme sports, like mountaineering, it's a way of uh, being free and controlling yourself. Now, in our society, we talk about nothing but precaution. We always want to uh, make the government responsible for anything that happens. And finding a place where people can feel free and actually take responsibility for their own lives, that's essential. And were that to disappear, it would be a tragedy. For young people, there would be nothing left to place yourself in danger, but addictions. And they would take uh, risks, you know, ride a motorcycle at high speed on the uh, Parisian ring road. Whereas in the mountain, you can actually uh, take responsibility of your own life, commit yourself, and you feel like you're sovereign over your own, over your own life. And that is a very important thing, which unfortunately is being threatened. Four or five years ago, I was uh, walking with some friends in South Africa, in the Duncansberg, a chain of mountains in South Africa. We'd been walking for like three hours on the path, backpack and everything. And there comes a ranger with his hat. He says, hello. And he says, can you please show us your tickets? We said, what tickets? He said, well, you have to have a ticket to be here. And he showed us very far away in the valley, a little gate we suppose we should have gone through to pay for a ticket so we don't go on the path. Without paying, and at the same time, it means that they know where we are. And I thought, my God, if there comes a day when you can't even walk a path in the mountain without paying for a ticket, buying a ticket, this is crazy. And this is something that is going to happen in our mountains. It's a constant threat. I spent my the lockdown in the mountains, and uh, the uh, gendarmes we found that it was easier to uh, look after the mountains during the lockdown uh, than uh, in live in the city. Use helicopters three times a day to check whether the, some people weren't going to climb the mountain and maybe contaminate uh, a fox or a mountain hyrax. And obviously, in the mountains, everybody went for a stroll, went for a walk. And in the beginning, beginning when there was still snow in March, we would go with uh, skis and a white sheet. And as soon as we heard the helicopter, we would lie under the, the bed sheet and the helicopter could not see us because the bed sheet was white on the snow. And that was funny. But when you're used to seeing mountain landscapes and you consider them as a freedom, a free environment, it's unbelievable how fast the administration can turn them into a forbidden area, a controlled area. And even outside of the COVID pandemic, it is happening, for instance, in the Mont Blanc. And rightly so, because there are fair too many people in the Mont Blanc. I mean, the normal path up the Mont Blanc in the summer looks like a motorway. And people leave trash around the, uh, the camping site, uh, and there are far too many people climbing the Mont Blanc. But because of this, there is a fight between two behaviors, two attitudes, 
l'autre côté, on, normal d'ailleurs. On the side of Saint-Gervais, where the uh, pass starts to go up the uh, Mont Blanc, they are thinking of uh, delivering a permit, like the Himalaya. You have to ask for permission, and you cannot climb the mountain without a guide. And they're going in that direction. They now have a white sort of police brigade in the uh, sort of halfway up the mountain, two people from the local town hall who check whether you have uh, made a reservation and uh, bought a ticket. Okay, fair enough. But what is that going to be? Is it the beginning of the end? And in the name of uh, environmental protection, and it is true that our mountains are being threatened and they are melting, but in the name of uh, all the good we want to do to the environment, we are at risk of closing a free space. And a free space is the contrary of a deadly addiction. It is another kind of addiction, but it's the opposite of a deadly a lethal addiction. It's a reasoned addiction that may allow some people to put themselves in danger, but it starts by telling you how to control freedom. And controlling freedom is not something that we can all do. And it gives you control over your own life and your own uh, mankind. And it's a way to give back freedom to mankind and define mankind. Thank you very much for your attention. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Christophe. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. Finalement, être une pièce rapportée. You feared that you would not fit in what you do. Everything you've said d'une certaine manière was première journée et demie actually something that we have discussed so far during this first two days a lot of what you said ties in with what we have been discussing for the last two days tout à fait tout à fait fine and uh, you have observed this in a very beautiful way thanks to your the fact that you're a writer so before you go back to your addictive mountain we can take a couple of questions uh, first question <laughs> you think there will be a question? I mean, I'm not addicted to mountaineering. I, I, I do climb mountains, but just like everybody else, I could have an accident. It's happened once, four years ago. I climbed and I... Uh, rock broke and, and I fell with it. But no, you know, mountaineering for me is not an addiction. I don't think I have an addiction. But if for some reason you are deprived of uh, the mountains, if I don't go to the mountains for a long time, there is a kind of craving and depression that appears. Are there any questions? Maybe questions from the floor. I have a question. Thank you very much for this beautiful conference, this beautiful lecture. You talked about uh, lethal addictions, tragedies, ropes that break. I'd like to know whether in your experience you felt autolytic trends in your personal experience or in history, suicidal trends, because it is a deadly, a lethal addiction in a way. That's a question we ask ourselves when we see the way people are climbing mountains today. Have you ever heard of Alex Arnold? You may have seen his movies there on Netflix. He climbs very difficult mountains with nothing, no ropes, no safety. If he falls, he falls, he's dead. Some people say it's a suicidal behavior. I don't think so. I think the opposite. I think it's de volonté de puissance extreme. It's a way to show his power, extreme power. Living power. He wants to show people I'm so much on top of everything. I control danger so much that nothing is going to happen to me. So it's not suicidal. It's more like playing Russian roulette. A kind of Russian roulette. 
On met pas de balles. With no bullets in the pistol, or as few bullets as possible in the pistol. J'ai observé ça assez souvent. I have seen this happen. Effectivement, moi j'en ai vu. But also, I have uh, seen people die in the mountains, and ça devait arriver là. Ça devait en arriver là. Afterwards, people think it was meant to happen. Enfin, j'en ai pas vu tant que ça, mais j'ai eu quelques exemples. I've, I've seen a few examples. Euh, qui en fait euh, sont souvent des conflits. Alors là, on va pas faire de la psychiatrie. Well, I don't want to go into psychiatry, but very often uh, it happened the result following a family fight. Extrêmement fort. For instance, a fight with the father. The mountain has something to do with the father figure. Mais j'ai constaté. I don't know why, but I um, I have seen that many of my uh, friends who were very much into mountaineering. Avait ou avait actually had an issue with their father. Their father had been very uh, authoritarian, very hard. And that's why I don't have an addict. I'm not an addict uh, to. I'm not addicted to mountains because my father was more absent than authoritarian. But I had, do have a few examples around me in my surroundings where the mountain actually becomes a way to create a show. For the benefit of somebody you want to impress, somebody who's always crushed you down, somebody who's never encourage your self-esteem. Toujours dans le inconscient de la personne. And in the person's unconscious, uh, the feeling is that this father will only acknowledge you once you're dead. So it's pushing the limit. Vous en sortez, c'est que finalement vous n'êtes pas. As long as you uh, survive, it means you haven't pushed the limit far enough. And once you do push the limit to the very end, then that father will finally acknowledge you. Absolutely. So it's a total accomplishment syndrome that I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation. And in the movie shot by Christophe Rella, he compares astronauts who went to the moon. Astronauts, they were on the moon. And uh, he said, "Okay, what else can you do? I mean, you've gone to the moon. Armstrong went crazy, actually. What else can you do? For the alpinists, it's a bit. And for mountain climbers, climbers, it's the same. There's a sort of depression. There comes a stage when you uh, succumb to uh, depression because you have no other goal. There is nothing." Further for you to achieve. You know, when you want to uh, do even better and better and better, there comes a time when there is nothing else. Once you've reached the summit, you've reached the summit. You can't go anywhere else. And so people suffer from depression syndromes. But death is not all that pregnant. That present, and that's why I wanted to write about accidents. Because death is not all that pregnant. All that present, and that's why I wanted to write about accidents. Because death. Is there? It happens sometimes. So sometimes the accidents are lethal, but death is uh, less uh, present than in the French Academy, for instance. For other reasons, it is very inhabited by death. In the French Academy, many people die. Enfin, tous les rituels de l'Academy sont. I mean, the, all our rituals uh, at the French Academy are uh, focusing on death. And, you know, the nickname of the uh, French academicians is the immortal, so that's funny. Or when you join the French Academy, there is a ceremony. Installation, they call it. It's a it's a private ceremony in a room where no one else is allowed to go. And when you walk in, everybody stands up, and the ceremony leader says, "Okay, everybody stands. We will stand twice today and the day you die." Alors ça calme, vous voyez. It's very humbling. Non, mais tous les rituels autour de la mort. Now all the rituals that have to do with death are very present in our academy. We have a painting of the Cardinal de Richelieu. Du portrait de. It's it's a copy of the painting made by Philippe de Champagne. It's a huge painting. And at the end of the first session, when you join the academy, as a newcomer, you are asked to move forward. Everybody leaves. And the ceremony leader opens a tabernacle that contains another portrait, still by Philippe de Champagne, Richelieu, but Richelieu on his deathbed. And uh, he says to you, "That's what being immortal looks like." And it's very interesting. But it's it's a different way to look at death. It's a different way to look at death. It's a different way to look at death. 
qu'un passage it means that dans quelque chose qui vous you're only going through something that started long before you and will continue long after you're gone. You're only passing through and death is there to put a limit to the things you will try to do, endeavor to do, or hope to do. And at the same time, it encourages you to, encourages you to do your best. Whereas when you're climbing mountains, death is not something that you look forward to, which seems paradoxical. Take a mountain like the Servan. There are plates everywhere, crosses, plates. And it happens in many mountains. I recently went to uh, Mexico. I climbed Les Esquicual, which is a, a volcano close to Huacatepel, which is uh, erupting right now. But the other one is uh, easier. When you reach the the end, you have to uh, walk on all fours, and you find uh, crosses. And uh, the cross says, 11 student uh, uh, at this date who took the wrong path and, and died, fell to their death. So death is everywhere. But that's not something we look forward to. I have never seen anyone kneel down in front of those crosses. It's for the families, but it's not for us. It's not for us passing by. So it's different. It's not mystical. It's and I'm sorry, actually. I'm sorry. I made a very abstract description, but it would have been uh, useful to... Uh, bring the landscape into the picture, the beauty of the landscape, the power of the mountain landscape, the beauty of a storm hitting a wall, a mountain wall, or the beauty of the rocks themselves, those rocks that we are clinging to because we touch them, we cling to them, and they taste different. Some rocks will look completely different from uh, granite uh, and granite uh, it is uh, very different from other kinds of rocks and is climbed differently. So it's there is life. Actually, mountains are a lifeless place. But we feel like it lives uh, even more when we're not there. The American literature regarding nature testifies to this. We are in awe of things that do not make sense to us, but they make sense to themselves. And that's precisely the life that we're attracted to. It's not death that we're attracted to. Honestly, death is, death is, is just pushed out. We, we, we do everything we can to mitigate it. When you climb a glacier, you actually tie yourself with a rope to your companions to make sure that you don't fall in a crevice and die. It's, so, it's almost like being addicted to life. Absolutely. It's like being addicted to life. You're quite right. That's why I'm saying that uh, depriving, when I'm deprived of uh, the mountain or actually uh, Le jour où on aura a sailboat. A sailboat is, is also something where you, you feel very free. But if someday we eliminate those uh, places where we can feel free, like sailboats or mountains, what are the people going to do? Those people who are happy climbing mountains, what else will they do? They probably will indulge in something far more dangerous and serious. Mountains are actually channeling their energy. And it's also an environment where people are very friendly. They know each other. You, 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 you don't tell lies when you go up a mountain. You can't start saying, I've climbed this and that, and nobody will believe you. In five minutes, they'll know exactly who you are, because they will see exactly how good you are. So you're not. there's no cheating and lying when you go up the mountains. And whether you have a university degree or a lot of money or no money at all makes no difference. It's a place for brotherhood, and it's one of those unique places where brotherhood is what matters most. Thank you, Jean-Christophe. We have a couple of minutes left if somebody has a burning question, and if you want to listen to Jean-Christophe some more minutes, I would spend the evening with you. 
topo qui était vraiment Thank you for this beautiful presentation. I have a question. sont liés à la très haute montagne type l'Himalaya d'une Are there any features that have to do with very high mountains like Himalaya and what was the role of uh, substances uh, taken by uh, mountain climbers before and during and after they climbed the mountain. Well, substances have always played a very mysterious role. L'origine, c'est vraiment le mouvement hippie. When the guys started climbing mountains with no tools, fermis as they call it, that came immediately after the hippie movement. So yes, cannabis and joints. Et très, Definitely had something to euh, mais do there. Le, bon, la, la substance la plus euh, connue, si the vous most le, famous le, uh, substance is uh, euh, liquor. Euh, It's a genepi, a liquor bon, made from euh, mountain dire, plants. Milieu, beaucoup, hein. People drink a lot when they climb mountains in the uh, shelters. You know, they, they very often have a little flask of alcohol in the uh, shelters just to celebrate um, a feat, conquer. But uh, whether it had any influence uh, on the way people climb the mountains, I don't know, because they wouldn't tell. Himalaya is special. If you think about the uh, main uh, mountain climbers of the uh, end of the 20th century, all those who went up the Himalaya have died. The Himalayan environment, contrary to the uh, de garantir Ops absolument que vous échapperez à does not guarantee that you can uh, escape death. To climb the Everest, you have to go through the, what we call the icefall, a huge glacier in a very dangerous area. Now, we would never climb uh, the front of those glaciers uh, in the, the Alps. So the front of the glacier looks stable, but it's very unpredictable. It can break off at any time. And a piece of ice uh, looking like a tower will fall, and you can never predict that, and you fall off with it. In, in France, in the Alps, you would never climb a glacier like that. But in the Himalaya, you have to go up there. You can't reach the top of the Everest without climbing one of those glaciers. And that's why it's dangerous. And there are also there is the uh, altitude of uh, death in the Everest. An altitude at which uh, we find uh, bodies, uh, people who just died and were left there for years. They've mummified themselves and people die without having a disease or anything. It's just the altitude that, that kills them. Even though they have no risk factors, no cardiovascular disease, you can't, you can't stay away from danger in the Everest. That's what is very special about the Himalaya. De, de la vie et de la mort n'est pas... The control over life and death is not absolute. In the Alps, uh, bearing uh, rocks falling on top of your head, there's not much that can happen to you. Merci beaucoup, Jean-Christophe. Thank you very much. We're going to have to leave it at that, unfortunately. It's painful. Je te remercie sincèrement. Thank you so much for having taken the time to uh, stop here in Paris to talk to us. Uh, thank you. It was fascinating as usual. See you tomorrow. Have a nice evening. We will be back tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock.